I'm Neil Fender from World Bank. Um, I manage the bank's open data initiative, uh, which is essentially data.worldbank.org. Um, but let me ask first, before I get going, um, who's head of the World Bank? Come on. Yes. Who knows what we do? Great. What do we do? <laughs> <laughs> we eradicate poverty is what yeah. we do. Yeah. Right, right on. Um, and, and that's our target, we eradicate poverty. We, we do that by lending money to, to governments, investing in infrastructure and in, in, in different projects that will alleviate poverty. So the question is kind of why are we interested in data and why are we interested in open data? So I started with this slide uh, because I think that um, we've recognized that data is an asset. Um, I think you've heard that over the last <coughs> couple of days. You know, it's a, it's, as I say here, it's a public good for a public it's a public good for the public good. We're aiming at people like this uh, to improve their lives. So we kind of have a purpose for what we do in, in terms of open data. Um, this is a talk about data publishing at the World Bank. So I wanted to sort of go back in time a little bit and go back to the beginning of the World Bank's <coughs> efforts at data publishing. This is from, this is, uh, from 1965, uh, our very first data publication, which was called the World Bank Atlas. Um, Someone said yesterday, those graphics are really cool, right, for 1965. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a pretty good, you know, map. I mean, that, was, that would have taken quite a long time to do. And what you see there, the data here, is, um, is, is GNI, the gross national income per capita, a kind of proxy for income per capita of the world. You see there the U.S. has a population of 192 million people. Anybody know what it is today, more or less? 300, more or less? 320? It will take 20 million, 300. <laughs> and they see Canada, interesting, what, um, 19 million. What's Canada's population today? 35. 35, you know that, right? You know that. And the, the GNI per capita of Canada, 1,940, quite a lot less than the US. I was interested to see that. Um, but I guess today it's similar. Um, anyway, we, that's how we published things for a long time. In a, in a book, it was well regarded in the development community. Uh, 40 years on, come to 2010, more or less, um, and we'd start to publish things electronically, um, and the data set had grown, and in fact it became so popular um, that we charged for it. We used to charge you, if you wanted to access it, you, you just had to pay <coughs> $200 per person, or a bit more if you're an institution, and actually it was a really good business. Um, my department used to make more or less uh, $2 million a year out of it, which kind of paid for, for the work. Um, so we thought that was a pretty good, good business model, but we had a problem with that. Um, and we had this, anybody know this guy? Hans, Hans. Hans. yeah, Hans, you know my first name, yeah, Hans Lofgren. Um, but he told us that we have um, something called DBHD. Um, anybody hear of H1N1? Remember H1N1? Mm -hmm. Kind of really bad flu, right? Asian flu and all that. Um, really bad disease, but Hans Rosling says that was nothing compared to DBHD. Anybody know what DBHD stands for? Database Hugging Disorder is what it stands for. <laughs> <laughs> so, and he said we had to rid ourselves of, of Database Hugging Disorder, and I'm glad to say that we did. So we stopped selling the data, the data that we had in 2010. <coughs> we had to find that money from somewhere else. Um, and we then started to publish data in an open format, uh, openly on the World Bank. That's data.worldbank.org, this is part of of the front page, and it, it's a little bit more attractive, I think, than, uh, than what we used to do. And we were able to free up a lot of the data around the bank. Um, so having done that, and I think it was a successful initiative, um, I wanted to just give you some thoughts about what's made publishing data good or bad at the World Bank. We've been doing it about five years. What, what, makes, it, what makes our open data publishing uh, work, and, what, and perhaps some of the things you might you might take into account when you're doing your own publishing of data. I think the first lesson, and, and perhaps the most important to, uh, for us, is something I think David Eves of Canada uh, wrote about be long before we, we started our own uh, open data initiative, which was make it indexable, make it spiderable, I guess. So en engines like Google and others can, can find that stuff. Um, it's, it's, it's fine having published your data in a website or in a, in a tool, uh, but if, if users can't find it, it's not much use. Um, I think uh, we have around 60% of referrals to our data sets from Google. So people are, are searching for things like G GDP, in this case GNI per capita, they're searching from Google. They're not coming to the World Bank 
uh, directly looking for data. So number one, make it findable. Number two, um, they really don't want your <laughs> query tool. <laughs> um, this is this is what happens when you when you tie people up in inside your own software. Um, it's what I do, even with with my own system. Actually, when we look and we can't we can't find what we're looking for, you know, it's kind of page path. Um, so that's the second that's the second lesson. Get them to the data quickly. Get them lost in, uh, you, you want them to be lost in your data, not in your query tool or in your uh, data retrieval system, right? So try to get them quickly to the data. Third point, use open li licensing. That's kind of obvious thing, I guess, if we're doing open data, but it's important and uh, not always uh, remembered. We built our own open data initiative on the back of our access to information policy which is by default open now. If it's not, uh, to make something closed now, you have to actually go and say why it should be closed. Otherwise, it will be open. And that license has, has helped us to uh, establish this uh, open data access policy. We essentially use a CC BY attribution license um, with, with slight modifications. And what we don't do anymore is have subscriptions to our database, and we don't restrict commercial use. There are still many data producers that still think that, well, let the public see it, but if you want to use it commercially, you're going to have to pay it. And it's unclear why that's, why that's useful. Use open formats is another one. Again, um, very simple stuff, kind of obvious. We heard it on the first day, don't use PDFs. Or if you use PDFs, make sure the original data is available. Um, don't use proprietary formats. So we try to publish in these formats. We actually don't publish very much in RDF. We don't really see the demand, but um, but these are the things we do. Uh, next lesson, um, Stephen already mentioned this, but we found that APIs are kind of the answer to everything when it comes to data publishing. Um, even across the World Bank now, we use our own APIs to produce data.worldbank.org, and we consolidate, we have various sort of federated data stores inside the World Bank. It's a big, big organization, so there isn't a single data store. But if you want to be in our data publish publishing model, if you want to be in data.worldbank.org, you need to have an API so that we can uh, harvest that data from the API. Um, so we think it's kind of the answer. Um, as I say, this data site, data.worldbank.org, is built around public APIs. So we're using our own data. That way, uh, we see what others have to deal with when they use our data, and we fix stuff when we see it doesn't work. Um, this is just some of the examples of people that have used our API. Um, I'm a statistician, so I'm kind of a big fan of data and R and these sorts of things. Um, people have built links to our data API directly in R, directly in Stata. Um, so I can just um, uh, write a little program to access our data from R, and it's instant. Um, I don't have to do that time and time again. I don't have to go to my own data query tool and download it. Um, it's much easier that way. Uh, and of course, uh, remember that other people will do things uh, better. There's a thing called <coughs> Joy's Law. I don't know if you've heard of that, but the idea is that uh, all, the, all the clever people work somewhere else, not with you. Um, and I think that's important to remember. And that's why we're interested in APIs. That's why we want to publish data openly. This is an example from Google. We, we're, we're the World Bank, so we have to be aware that many of our client countries, um, <coughs> English is not their first language. So if we want them to consume our data, we need to translate it. Um, actually, Google has translated our data set into 38 languages because they also want to use it. Um, and so we're quite happy with that. We use that ourselves. Um, so something else to remember. Um, it's kind of my, maybe my, <laughs> another very important one, uh, sort of lab label your stuff. Um, this, this, if I said metadata, you'll be familiar with that. Um, but you can't do enough with metadata. You can't label your stuff enough. These cans are no good if we don't know what's inside them. Um, so, so let me repeat, label your stuff uh, and label it carefully. Um, almost a final thought. Um, this is kind of uh, one of my favorites. Uh, make yourself a time machine. Uh, we, we made a time machine just a few months ago. Terry was at the back and, and we sort of worked on that together. It's fantastic. We can go all the way back to 19, I think about 87 uh, with our time machine. All we're doing is publishing our archives um, in ways in which, which people can put them together. Um, it doesn't sound very complicated, but actually it's, it is more complicated than you think. Um, but at the same time, it's relatively straightforward to do. 
Um, this was kind of my time machine before we published, before we made our own little tool to do it. This is my bookshelf. Um, so if I wanted to know what data we were publishing on any particular country years ago, I had to go to the book and look it up. Um, today, I can find out what our different revisions have been to the same data uh, directly from, the, um, from, our, from our little time machine. So this is just a chart of, I think it's uh, Tanzania's GNI per capita. This is what we've published over the years. You can see we've changed it quite a bit over time as revisions have been made, maybe to population numbers, but maybe to the GNI numbers themselves. Um, this is uh, Fred, Alfred, actually. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Fred. Anybody heard of Fred? Federal Reserve Economic Database? OK, yeah, one person at the back is going crazy. Uh, so actually, this is the number one takeaway then from, from my talk. If you've never seen Fred, go look it up. It's a fantastic tool. Um, it's done by the St. Louis Federal Reserve. Um, better than FRED, actually, it's ALFRED. ALFRED stands for Archival Version of FRED. And there they have every, everything they've published in one humongous great database. This, these two lines are the GDP of the United States. Um, as I think the blue one is as it was if you were looking at it in um, 2011. The red one is as it, as it is in today, in 2015. They, the US revised its GDP from 10 trillion to I don't know 10.3 trillion in 2014. Um, that's 300 billion dollars. Um, that's that's 50 times the GDP of Ghana. Uh, just to give you an, an example, that changes things, right? When when 300 billion dollars is added to the world economy, or what we thought we knew about the world economy. So having this kind of time machine is kind of important to understand um, if you're using these these data. Okay, last, last slide. Um, not clean all the things, but open all the open things. Um, I think others might say this as well, but um, one of the things we've tried to do at the World Bank is try to find all those things which are sort of under the stone uh, so we can turn them over and see whether they should be open. People don't think of, even though we're, we're sort of open by default, people don't think of data in the same way as they think of documents. So we've been trying to sort of clean house and find all those open things that should be open. So this is the summary of it. Have a purpose uh, when you're publishing da data. Make it index the stuff. Uh, get them lost in your data, not your beautiful system. Uh, label your stuff, really. Uh, use your own open data. Open all the open things. Uh, make a time machine. Uh, that's kind of number one. And then finally, listen to your users. Thank you very much. So questions, I, I believe you can jump up to the mic if you've got questions for Neil or just shout it out from the, the table. I've certainly got one I'm keen to know about. Um, so Neil, that seems like a lot of work. Can you give any indication of just how much resourcing you had to put into it? How much would it have cost? What types of resources have, has gone into all this? Um. Well, for, I mean, for a start, we like I say, we, we lost $2 million a year, so that was uh, two million dollars. Um, <laughs> uh, and then it, our initial build of data.worldbank.org was, was not terribly expensive. I mean, talking hundreds, a couple of hundred thousand dollars. Um, I guess over time we've had to invest a little bit more as we've, we've had to, um, we did it very quickly to start with. I think we built it in four weeks, but we've had to sort of comply with IT policies and all this kind of thing. And that's, that's um, added a little bit to the cost. We've had to do some rebuilding. But, but you know, you're talking of that order of magnitude, not uh, not millions of dollars, I would say. But and what types of resources, resources in terms of internal people, programs? Uh, goodness. Um, well, we're a team of around sort of that, that curate most most of the data. I guess we're a team of around about uh, 20 to 30 people. Um, there are other parts of the bank too that are involved in this, um, and, m and maybe you're talking sort of five to, to 10 people altogether, involved in actual systems development, if you like. Um, you know, I would say maybe maybe less than a dozen altogether, something like that. But it's a bit difficult to say because what one thing that did, it did trigger when we started was that many other departments in the bank decided to publish their own data sets. And some of them were um, different data sets than the ones we traditionally had. So they required additional investment in, in different places. So, and yeah. 
Any other questions? I've got another follow-on question. Yeah? Uh, I do not quite well get the point. We get them lost in the data. It's always uh, useful to have them, to be able to select some countries with some indications. Why do you say we get them lost in the data? Yeah, I agree. I completely agree with you. It is useful. But um, we see many examples, and I, I wouldn't count the World Bank as uh, I wouldn't discount our own systems from those, where you know the, the software developers get very um, excited about developing complicated systems, um, and they don't have the user in mind always when they do it. Um, it may be that we, we have both. We have our own uh, retrieval system where you can select and whatnot. And then we have very simple systems where if you want all the data we have on Tanzania, for example, you can get that with one click in a spreadsheet. Um, it's a big spreadsheet, but that's, if that's the way you want it, then let them, let them have it. Mostly it was on Tanzania in two indicators. I want mortality in Tanzania. Why should I just say? So, so if I want mortality in Tanzania, what I type in Google is mortality yeah. Tanzania. Okay? That, w that will not get you inside our query system. That will, get, that will get you to Google. What you want is that that does return you something, that that finds you something. Um, and that's what we try to do. But you have to have a different approach than having something embedded in a query system if that's, if that's what you want to do. But I completely agree. That's what people want to do. But oftentimes, the, the developers don't always see it that way. So, I mean, lots from Neil. I'd like to invite now Sarah Burke to come up and speak from AppDevate.